Now, there's also diabetic neuropathy affecting the nerves. And many nerves in the body can be affected. There's a polyneuropathy affecting many nerves. And this can affect basically all of the peripheral nerves. So it can affect the sensory nerves, the motor nerves, and the autonomic nerves. So the sensory nerves are the nerves bringing sensation from the hands and the feet and the body towards the central nervous system where it can go to the brain to be experienced as sensation. So there can be peripheral sensory neuropathy, death of the sensory nerve fibres. And also, to a lesser extent, it can affect the motor nerves. The motor nerves are the nerves that bring impulses from the central nervous system out to facilitate movement. So the sensory nerves can be affected a lot. The motor nerves are affected less commonly, but can certainly be affected. And the other group of peripheral nerves that can be affected is the autonomic nervous system. You might remember that the autonomic nervous system is divided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is controlling numerous autonomic functions in the body. Now, pathologically, what's going wrong here? Well, one thing is that hyperglycemia can adversely affect the Schwann cells. Adverse effects on the Schwann cells. So if you remember a nerve fibre, here we have a nerve fibre, peripheral axon or dendrite, it could be either. And we have the Schwann cells around about. And the Schwann cells are individual cells, and these produce layers of myelin. So what's going wrong here? Well, one is there's a direct metabolic effect on these Schwann cells. So you can get degeneration of the Schwann cells themselves. But of course, remember these patients also have macrovascular and microvascular disease. And both of those can reduce the circulation to the neurons, perhaps particularly the microvascular disease. So they're supposed to be blood vessels supplying blood to the neurons as with anything else, capillaries. And if there's disorder of these blood vessels, then it's reasonable to assume that the neurons are going to become hypoxic. So there's damage to the swan cells. There's probably ischemic effects in the neurons themselves. And neurons, of course, are very sensitive to oxygen lack, so that makes sense. And also the hyperglycemia is probably going to have direct metabolic effects on the neuron itself. So we're going to get this neuropathy. Now, in the autonomic nervous system, this is going to affect the automatic functions of the body. And of course, there are so many of these, and we looked at some of these at the start of this take. So, for example, there can be effects on the swallowing nerves. Now, when you swallow, the autonomic nervous system supervises the peristaltic activity of the esophagus, taking the food down the way. Swallowing is actually a peristaltic activity. It's not a gravity activity. Well, it's aided by gravity, but you can actually swallow upside down if you were silly enough to try it, because it's peristaltic. But if the nerves go into the esophagus die off, then that's no longer coordinated. So that can give rise to dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing. And you need lots of autonomic nervous activity to control the stomach, to control the motility of the stomach. So again, if there's an autonomic nephro if there's not autonomic neuropathy, it's very easy to get your nephropathies and neuropathies confused. If there's an autonomic neuropathy, then that can affect the mobility of the stomach and that can give rise to gastroparesis, a weakness of the stomach. And patients with gastroparesis complain of all sorts of things, like they can only eat certain foods and they get bad indigestion because the stomach's not working properly. And of course, when you lie down and you go to stand up, you need to maintain the blood supply to the brain. So the heart needs to be harder and you need to increase blood pressure and you need to peripherally vasoconstrict. And all of those things are dependent on the autonomic nervous system. So patients with autonomic neuropathy often get postural hypotension as well. They can feel quite dizzy when they stand up. 
And there's numerous other effects. Disorder of the bladder, for example, because again, that depends on autonomic nerves. Often, tragically early, there can be erectile dysfunction and impotence at a relatively early age. That can partly be as a result of the, uh, the vascular supply to the penis, but also largely it's caused by the autonomic neuropathy. So all of those things can go wrong as a result of effects on the nervous system. Now I think we'll carry on at this point and talk about um, reduced inflammation. Diabetics often don't show a normal inflammatory response. Let's think about why this might be. So here we have a normal capillary that we're familiar with, with the vascular endothelial cells, as you know. And also, as you know, there's a basement membrane. And in badly controlled diabetes, this membrane thickens. And the thick basement membrane is going to reduce the ability of the small blood vessels to dilate. It's almost like a sleeve or a sheath around about the blood vessels that stop them dilating. Because normally in an inflammatory response, there's going to be damage to tissue cells and that's going to bring about the release of inflammatory mediators. And the inflammatory mediators primarily act on the blood vessels to dilate them. So in inflammation, there's a vasodilation. That's what gives rise to the heat and the redness. And the vasodilation also means the cells are further apart, so you get exudates coming out, causing swelling. That's normal. Heat, pain, redness, swelling, loss of function, all normal effects of inflammation, and all very important for the healing process. Inflammation actually is the first stage in the wound healing process. But in people with basement membrane thickening, the capillaries can't dilate, so they don't have the normal inflammatory response. And this means two things. First of all, they don't have the normal protection and wound healing benefits that inflammation gives. But also, from your point of view, what it means if a, a wound becomes infected in someone with diabetes, you're not going to see the normal inflammatory response, so it's harder to recognise wound infection in diabetes. So if someone's got badly controlled diabetes, they've got basement membrane thickening, they have a soft tissue infection, or infection around about a wound, you might not see the normal heat, pain, redness, swelling. So you've got to have a high index of suspicion for infection in diabetic wounds and look for things like altered exudate, smell from the wound, the more subtle features of wound infection rather than the obvious it goes red and swelling type of, um, type of clinical features, high index of suspicion. Because infection, as well as this, is a particular problem in, in diabetes. So normally if we have some um, bacteria getting into a tissue, that's a good definition of, of, of infection actually. Infection is the presence of bacteria in a tissue. Well normally a nice big macrophage will come along and uh, phagocytose them and digest them. But if there's high levels of sugar, high levels of glucose in these tissue fluids surrounding the capillary, well again that means two things. Um, the high levels of sugar are good for the bacteria because the bacteria can eat the sugar. It's a metabolic substrate, so that's going to help the bacteria to proliferate. And also, if there's high levels of sugar in the tissue fluids, the macrophages cannot migrate to the bacteria as they normally would. They find it difficult to move through the high blood sugar medium not high blood sugar, high tissue fluids, because th this is the sugar in the, these are the tissue fluids here. So if there's a lot of sugar in the tissue fluids, the macrophages can't effectively migrate through that fluid, therefore they can't get to the bacteria to phagocytose them. So infection is a particular problem in diabetes, because reduced inflammatory response 
high levels of glucose in the tissue fluids means that the bacteria have got lots of nice things to eat and it inhibits the normal migration of the cells which would normally phagocytose the infecting bacteria. So always have a high index of suspicion for infection in diabetics, especially with wounds. Now the last point I want to look at is the effects that diabetes has on legs and feet.